so that sorry sorry Larry. i have to send this in so all right so who thinks recycling works raise your hand Don't well know. you can you gave it away <laughs> well, before before i said that <laughs> Oh well, yeah, before you said that, yeah. That's why yeah. I'm pushing it so hard. And, and most of the people do. Most of the people think that recycling works because we've been sold that, but it's a lie. It's a lie, but I won't give it away. So first of all, recycling, we, we put our stuff in the bin, a, a truck comes, picks the stuff up, and it goes to the recycling plant and it gets recycled. True or false? Supposedly true. Yes no that, that's what we think so yeah. our recyclables or just like any other raw material it has to be purchased first so if it's not purchased when it gets to the sorting plant where do you think it ends up in the trash <laughs> in the landfill in the landfill so yeah. it's no different from us throwing it right into the trash where the trash man comes in and going straight to the landfill because if you don't have a buyer that's where it ends up who knew this? We always thought, hey, it goes to the recycling. They're going to inst instantaneously recycle it and it becomes something else. No, it has to be a buyer. And that's why we had problems with China. China threw us off. We were good for a while, a good 20, 30 years until they said no more. And that sent ripples because we said, what do we, have, we do with our stuff now? Joni. I'm wondering, I know that the, like we all have vinyl plank flooring and I thought that was made out of recyclable plastic bottles. Carpeting is made out of uh, plastic bottles. Is that not happening or just is such a small amount? Very good, Joni. So it is a small amount. Um, there is some recycling done. Do, okay, do you know how much of our stuff is actually recycled? Give me a percentage. What do you say, Joni? 20? Okay, no, Linda said it. Less than 10% oh my. of hmm. our stuff. That means 90% of our stuff actually ends up in the landfill. Only 10%, less than 10%. Less than 5% gets recycled here in the US. It doesn't work. Look at these and weren't numbers. They, weren't they gonna use these um, uh, empty plastic bottles even for uh, a substitute for um, asphalt? Weren't, they, weren't we gonna have it uh, on the freeways or under the freeways? What happened to that? I mean, we heard about rubber also. They were gonna take rubber and rubber tires and use that for asphalt as well. The problem is cost. Again, it always comes down to money. And if it's not sustainable, they're not going to do it. Um, it takes for some companies to be very forward and start to do it, absorb those costs until it comes down. These are great ideas, but we need more people doing it. Well, we so, have to pay a fee. Uh, you know, the, on the plastic bottles and the aluminum cans when we buy. Yeah. And it's supposed to be. To cover the cost of recycling it or right. something like that. That was the original plan. That's right. not happening. No, no. Right. And, and really that, that fee was because uh, municipalities were footing the bill for taking away the plastics, which the plastic, the, the companies, the manufacturers were, had created this mess. So they said, municipalities said, we can't keep footing the cost for your problem. So the plastic industry, instead of absorbing the cost, they, they passed it off to us. You see what I mean? So that's how it works. That five percent, that five cents or whatever we pay is to have our recyclables hauled off. That's what we're paying for. Not to get recycled because if you recycle it, you, you need to turn it into something else. If you don't have a buyer who's willing to do that, the recycling plant is just sitting on mountains and mountains of waste. Tom? Uh, yeah, there's a difference, I guess, is that between reusing and recycling. Because the bottles we used to turn back in when we bought another were reused, right? Uh, I don't know. I don't think glass so. Glass bottles. Oh, the glass, glass bottles. bottles. Okay, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Today, we're really going to look at plastics today, uh, which is a little different from glass and aluminum, because okay. the, the, the plastics is really the big problem. Um, is, is it uh, sustainable? Is recycling sustainable and affordable? Who thinks that it's affordable? Well, if it were affordable, someone mm -hmm. would be doing it. Lots of people would be doing it. Mm -hmm. As and, you mentioned, people yeah. have tried and couldn't sustain it. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. And what do you say? Um, I lived in Ketchikan for three years. 
and um, they don't want, <laughs> they put stuff on the uh, ships to send back to the mainland. They go down to Seattle, so um, they don't want the waste in on the island. And then Seattle ships it to central Washington mm -hmm. uh, to bury it. And it, uh, when I think about how much waste comes off these various islands, it's, I don't know what all the states do. I, I just, I'm familiar with Washington. Okay, well, here's some examples. So New York, New York, it costs them $18 more uh, per ton to collect and recycle versus just uh, disposing it. So they so just to do something with the plastic, it's cheaper for them to dispose it versus paying $18 or more per ton to have it recycled and go through the process. Boston, Boston had to, had to add in another $4.8 million into the annual budget just for the recycling. So for a, a lot of them, they say it's just not worth it if only less than 10% is going to be recycled. It, it doesn't make fiscal, financial, economical sense to recycle. I hate to say it. I hate to say it. So it's actually cheaper to just either dispose of it or it's cheaper to manufacture pl plastics uh, versus going through the whole recycling process. And That's why the motto is reduce reuse Use. and then recycle. then recycle so don't mm -hmm. buy as much well yes. <laughs> like that's going to work in in this capitalistic <laughs> world um and reuse the thrift stores have to pay because so much junk is quote donated that they fill up dumpsters in my little town in anacortes washington to, ha to haul it off what was supposedly um, able to be sold at thrift st stores. So I don't think there's a moral or a, a, a real thoughtful approach to it. I think we just quickly want it out of sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, but I'm going to show you how we got here in the first place, because we didn't create the problem, but but the industry likes to pass it on to us and to, add, to get us to fix the problem or solve the problem. Here's another myth. Uh, we think that when you recycle plastic, you can recycle it over and over again. So that's a good thing, right? Because if it's, if it's recyclable, well, it degrades each time you recycle it. So you can only recycle it only two or three times, and then that's it. So eventually it's going to end up in the landfill such as how plastic works. Let me go ahead and show you that first video. We're gonna follow this really investigative reporting and we're gonna hear from some plastic insiders who are gonna tell us exactly how they created the problem. They were part of this problem. Let's go ahead and watch. Vinod Singh is the outreach manager at Far West Recycling. Every single piece of this has to be sorted in some way. You have, you have to separate paper and then the metals and then the plastic. There are a lot of different kinds of plastics that have to be sorted. And what we're doing here is we're sorting it out into the milk jug, the natural HDPE, the pigmented HDPE. Uh, PET water bottles. They're looking for plastic. Yeah, so all the plastic will come off before the line ends. Some items like soda bottles and milk jugs are easier to recycle, so there's money to be made. So this is all plastic that has a home. But most other types of plastic are technically difficult and often costly to recycle, and that makes them nearly impossible to sell. So they keep piling up. This is plastic that has no home. This is plastic that has no home. So it's your clamshells, um, Ziploc bags, film, uh, CD, um, a food, like a food wrapper. In the business, they're called mixed plastics. Now you're getting more mixed plastics 
uh, like pouches and everything comes in a, uh, in a clamshell now. Like so if somebody throws their Tide bottle into their bin, that's a win. Yeah. But what you're saying is you're seeing more and more we're, of this stuff. Packaging is evolving. Most mixed plastics end up in a place like this. What you're seeing happening right now is that's a, a full size, that's a, probably a 53 foot trailer. Yeah. In Medford, Oregon, Rogue Disposal's landfill takes about 100 loads of trash a day, and more and more of it is plastic. The plastic films, plastic bags, uh, the plastic wrapping that comes around a lot of packaged goods, yeah, that exactly. all goes into the garbage. It's margarine tubs, clamshells, deli containers. Until there is a viable option for recycling those things, we should be putting it in a landfill. But that's not what we've been told for decades. As the things we buy have been increasingly packaged in plastic. Hey, David. I'm Laura Sullivan. Very nice to nice meet you. Nice to meet you, Very too. Very nice to meet you. Welcome to Portland. David Alloway is a senior policy analyst with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. So much of all this stuff in the grocery store is plastic now. It's really inexpensive. It's an easy way to package it. It is, and it performs it performs very well. It has really good engineering qualities. It protects food very well. This is my basic question, because I, it seems like everybody's buying lettuce in a box. Is this recyclable? None of this is recyclable. Okay, what about all these? This is everywhere in every supermarket. All right, but thank you for your again, there are no food type programs in any of these tubs. Okay, so this is classic when a lot of Americans do this, like what you're doing right now. Yep, we flip right. it over. Yep. What, are, what are we looking at? <laughs> at the bottom of all these plastic containers is yeah. this little chasing arrow, the little recycling symbol with a number. And the number, there's, a, there's some words. It says one P-E-T-E. -E. This package here is technically recyclable. You could recycle this in a lab. Okay. But it's not economical to recycle it given the current economics of recycling. But if it's not happening in Oregon, it makes me wonder what's going on in the rest of the country. Yeah, I, would, I would say that this package is rarely recycled in most parts in the country. Yeah. Can I give you another example yes, here? Yes, please. So let's take a look at these blueberries. Okay. This is classic. And if you turn this over, you see the chasing arrows. On the bottom, it says 100% recyclable. There is no program in Oregon that wants this in the curbside mix, but more than half of all people that live in the Portland area believe this belongs in the curbside container. Well, it says it's recyclable. It says it's recyclable. It has the recycling logo. It's very confusing to a lot of people. This confusion about what can and can't be recycled and where plastic ultimately ends up is no accident. Over the past year, we've been investigating the plastic crisis and found that many of the problems we face today were set in motion decades ago by the very companies who make plastic in the first place. One of those companies is DuPont, and on the grounds of the first DuPont family home, I found the Hagley Library. It holds one of the world's largest collections of industrial history. This is an American city, a real community of homes and homemakers like thousands of others across the nation. We call it Plastics Town, USA. It's I'd come to see what its archive could tell me about the evolution of the plastic problem. The table is set with polyethylene products, too. America's post-war boom presented endless opportunities for this new, durable, lightweight material. Modern-day miracles that were made with the help of petrochemicals. From packaging to clothing to home furnishings. Very durable. Plastics' wide-ranging applications. Glassine, polyethylene, mild. Promised a new Ceram. world through chemistry. Step into the world of man-made materials that take up where nature left off. The thing that made them unique was the ability to do more with just a little bit of material, uh, to make things that we use lighter and more efficient. So plastic came to be used in many applications because it performed better. That was not a trick. A it did a good job of doing what it was asked to do. It made life uh, more efficient and easier. 
But by 1970, the plastic industry would have to confront the turbulent times of America's environmental awakening. One in every 10 Americans took part in rallies. Earth Day was one of the largest mass protests in U.S. history. Oh, Earth Day was profound in terms of people waking up to the fact that we live on a finite planet. And there was a lot of concern about the trend that was happening towards a more throwaway, disposable lifestyle. In response, many companies, including plastic makers and even some environmentalists, got behind an iconic ad campaign that focused attention on the public's role. And I remember being a kid and watching those ads. The most famous one with the crying Indian. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. He was actually Italian, dressed up like an Indian. <laughs> but the fake crying <laughs> Indian, this famous one, ends with this very dramatic people sentence don't. where they say, People start pollution. People can stop it. People all around the country bought that line and thought it was our responsibility to take care of litter. Americans discard more trash than any other country in the world. While the efforts to change consumer behavior help clean up the more visible litter problem. They did little to address the root cause. What makes our lives convenient is burying us. The unchecked growth in household waste. A barge filled with garbage is causing quite an international stink. Loaded with more than 3,000 tons of waste from New York. By 1987, a wandering barge called the Mogro became an emblem of the growing crisis. Greenpeace went and climbed aboard it and took a huge banner that we put on it. We said, next time, try recycling. It really became a metaphor of we are bumping up against limits here. We cannot keep just continuing this mindless consumerism, mindless consumption, and dump it somewhere else. America has a garbage problem too long ignored. At Hagley, we found a collection of internal plastic industry documents about this period of time, when the industry was in the crosshairs of the environmental movement and plastics were under attack. As we continued reporting, we found even more internal documents and court filings and spoke with over a dozen industry insiders, including three top executives who represented the big plastic producers and agreed to talk publicly for the first time. Back then, one of the vice presidents at the Society of the Plastics Industry was Lou Freeman. He now heads a local environmental coalition but he remembers a pivotal board meeting in the late 80s when the industry was worried about its public image. The vice president of the DuPont Company pulled me aside and said, uh, you, uh, you guys better get up to Wilmington. There's dissatisfaction about what's going on with the solid waste issue. We took a trek up to Wilmington and this one DuPont executive, he said, I think if we had $5 million, which seemed like a lot of money then. Five million. If we had $5 million, we could, we could, we could uh, solve this problem. They created the Council for Solid Waste Solutions, drawn from their ranks of big oil and petrochemical companies that made plastic, like Amoco, Chevron, Dow, and Exxon. The group had a plan and turned to a veteran of the industry, Ron Liesmer, to execute it. They want I'm going to pause it right there. He's a pivotal part to this whole situation, but... Um... Are you seeing what's happening right now so far? We were right there in the 70s and 80s. We were right there. We could have fixed the problem. We could have fixed the problem. It, it looks, if you look at the 70s, 80s, it looks like now. It, nothing's even worse. It's just nothing has changed. So what happened? Well, you, did you guys remember the uh, crying Indian? Do you guys remember that guy? Oh, yes. That was a very popular ad. Guess who put that ad out? The plastic industry did. Keep America beautiful. That was a campaign. Guess who was behind that? The plastic industry. So what they did was play both sides of the fence. They said, we have a problem. Instead of kind of like the beat them, we're going to join them. So they put out the ad. Everyone seen it. It was a very popular ad. And also they keep America beautiful. We need to recycle. So what they started to do is put... Uh, that, that um, triangle underneath every plastic bottle, this one has it. So this one is PET number one. So basically every single piece of plastic has that uh, chasing arrow, they call it. The chasing arrow looks very similar to the recycling arrow, but it's not the same. 
The chasing arrow is called the resin identification code. This was created by the plastic industry. There are seven of them. Only two of them are recyclable. Five of them are not. So why did they do that? So that when I buy a piece of plastic and I look and I see the chasing arrow, I say, oh, it's recyclable. I don't feel guilty. And that's why they did that. So to appease the public. But they did it deliberately. Absolutely. It's a scam. It's a scam. So people thought that, hey, okay, it's okay to buy plastic now because we're going to be able to recycle it when only two of the seven were recyclable. And they knew this. They knew this. That is a big time industry scam. And, and that's how they were able to get out of this. It's a sticky point from the uh, 80s because really there was a lot of outcry in the 80s and 90s. They started to ban certain plastics. Some man, you know, manufacturers, fast food places said, we're not going to buy them unless they can be recyclable. So they came up with this scam and says, hey, we're going to put this logo on. It's going to look like the recycling logo. Uh, and people are going to think that it's recyclable when really it's not. So imagine two pieces out of seven pieces of plastic can be recycled. That means the five pieces that are not end up in the landfill. And that's how we got here with all this plastic. It, it became even worse. It became even worse. That created this, this thing called single use plastic. And that's what we're, we're dealing with today. We buy a water bottle, we drink it, we throw it in the trash, single use. All right. Let's go ahead and hear from that insider now because he was hired to, to fix this problem. And he did. You know, even though it wasn't very moral, uh, you know, he did fix the problem. Let's go ahead and listen to it. It's a good thing he's talking now, but let's go ahead and listen. There was an attitude oh. that is real. Go ahead and turn the volume up. Has voted to ban all packaging made of two kinds of plastic. It was a critical moment. A growing backlash was threatening the future of plastic. In what may be part of a national trend, the City Council of St. Paul, Minnesota, voted to outlaw the use of polystyrene plastics. Liesmer was sent to Minnesota on an urgent mission. Brand name companies that used plastic were facing bans on their products. There was an attitude that if your product was not recycled, then it should not uh, be in the marketplace. So, so it was up to us in the plastics industry to solve this problem so that they could continue to package their products in plastic. And Liesmer found a solution. To appease government officials, the industry funded a local recycling pilot project. The industry attitude was, we'll set this up and get it going. But if the public wants it, they are going to have to pay for it. The plastic bans were averted. Do you think that they took a lesson away from how to fight the bans? Oh, yes, it was. We need to be doing things. Like what? Don't wait until legislation appears. You're saying preempted. Yes, do it first. And we did. Did you feel like they cared more about selling plastic than they did about making recycling work? Making recycling work was a way to keep their products in the marketplace. It was a way to sell plastic. Yes. It's a win-win situation. You get recycling going, that has its benefits, and it improves the image of the material. The industry found another way to promote plastic, using recycling. Responding to pressure from states and environmentalists to better identify the many types of plastic, it created a code to tell them apart. That code was a numbering system put inside the well-known symbol for recycling, the chasing arrows. The problem, recyclers said, is that it left the impression that all those kinds of plastics were actually being recycled. Coy Smith ran recycling centers in Southern California in the 1980s and early 90s. All right, there you are. During that time, the plastics industry, they went around to states and they convinced those states to pass laws and they did this very quietly. They passed laws that required that symbol with the number on it be put on plastic containers sold in that state. I mean, for most states they did it in, recyclers didn't even know what happened. And the next thing you know, all the plastic containers have these symbols on them. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? It's a bad thing. Why? Because the average person saw the symbol, they know the symbol, and said, 
well, it's recyclable, right? Got three arrows. I'm like, well, all of a sudden, our own customers, they would bring it in and not only say it has a triangle, but it would, they would flat out say, it says it's recyclable right on it. And I'd be like, I can tell you, I can't give this away. There's no one that would even take it if I paid them to take it. That's how unrecyclable it was. Stuck with plastics they couldn't sell. Smith and other recyclers met with representatives from the plastic industry. Do you see the yeah, one? There's my name right there. And came up with a report identifying key problems with the numbering code. Some firms are using it as a green marketing tool. The code is being misused. The plastic industry that you were working with agreed to these and signed on to this they report. Did. So they knew that these problems existed. They knew these problems existed, absolutely. Recyclers and the plastic makers couldn't agree on how to change the code. Industry would only switch to a triangle, which recyclers said was too similar to the chasing arrows. Industry wouldn't even consider, say, no triangle or no, a they, circle. Or, they didn't I mean, want to go anywhere near no triangle. We said, go to a square, go to some other symbol, just not the triangle. And they, they said no. Coming up with ways to have their product perceived as more recyclable and more environmental makes their product look better. They want to sell more plastic containers. Recyclers also appealed to government regulators, but they sided with industry. They said that the chasing arrow symbol was okay as long as it was small and on the bottom of packaging. What if it's got a chasing arrow sign on it and you think that means it's getting recycled? Uh, that, that was one of the uh, comments early that it implied that those products were being uh, recycled. Uh, were, that wasn't the were intent. They, were they misleading the public? Um, I don't think so, because when I looked at them, uh, at the arrows, I thought, this is a way to identify the products so that recycling, the early stages of recycling can take place. But even as Liesmer and his colleagues were publicly promoting recycling, privately, the industry had long expressed doubt it was ever going to happen on a broad scale. One internal document from the Society of the Plastics Industry cautioned, the techniques of cleaning and separating the mixed plastics has not been developed for large-scale economic application. Another said, there are no effective market mechanisms for mixed plastic. And this document was candid. There is serious doubt widespread plastic recycling can ever be made viable on an economic basis. How could they go into all of these communities and tell people you just have to recycle when they knew there were so many problems and so many hurdles? Some were very skeptical yeah. but felt they had to do it. I think others were, were more hopeful. Uh, there was never an enthusiastic belief that uh, recycling was ultimately going to work in a significant way. Freeman's boss at the time, Larry Thomas, the head of the Society of the Plastics Industry, was blunt about it. I was a front man for the plastics industry. No getting around it. Thomas wouldn't sit down for an on-camera interview, but agreed to talk on the phone. If the public thinks the recycling is working, then they're not going to be as concerned about the environment. I think they knew that the infrastructure wasn't there to really have recycling amount to a whole lot. Thomas wrote a confidential memo in 1989 about the precarious position the industry was in. The image of plastics among consumers is deteriorating at an alarmingly fast pace, it says. We're approaching a point of no return. Business is being lost. Analysts are beginning to take notice. We must immediately undertake a major program of unprecedented proportions to reverse this fast-moving tidal wave of growing negative public perception. So the big plastic producers came up with a multi-million dollar solution. When you look at plastic, advertising, you know how it helps things stay fresh and safe and light. It spent most of its money millions and millions of dollars on advertising. Plastic also saves energy. To tout the virtues of plastics as a way of heading off the criticism the industry was experiencing. When we started that advertising program, I think the image of plastics was in the mid-30s. So, you know, 30, 35 percent favorability. That's pretty low. If you're in politics, you're in deep trouble uh, with a 35 percent rating. Presenting the possibility
possibilities of plastics. plastics. When they were running the advertising on television, they were not about how plastics can be recycled, but all the wonderful things that plastics bring to us. Plastics make it possible. The fact that you now don't have to worry about dropping a shampoo bottle that was made out of glass on the bathroom floor because it's plastic. And there's nothing wrong in an industry promoting those kinds of things, but that's not addressing the problem that people are criticizing you about. And it worked? And it worked. Hmm. Because you went from 30% favorability. Yeah, in, 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 from, let's say, mid-30s to mid-60s. Favorability. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow. I'm, I'm kind of speechless. And you wonder why we're all cynical <laughs> at this age. I think we're pretty gullible. Gosh. They knew, and this reminds me of the cigarette industry, the oil industry, all these, they, they have all the information. They know exactly what they're doing, you know? So instead of uh, fixing the problem, they made it worse. So you heard it went from 35 to 60%. So people started saying, okay, it's okay to buy plastic. And they made more profits just by advertising their way out of it, but they lied. That's also deceptive. Those little triangles, that's really deceptive because it looks very similar to the recycling. So in hmm. case you're wondering how we got here, it's because of that. We could have had, we had it handled in the uh, 80s. Well, we were almost there. Linda? Uh, I said, thank you for presenting this. I really needed, <laughs> I really needed something else on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, gosh. I think it's important for us to know the truth, you know, that a lot of things are myths. We, we think we're doing the right thing. So, you know, Absolutely. we're. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I could feel virtuous when I saw that triangle and I would say that and really felt like I was accomplishing something. <laughs> I think most people do because we, we're good hearted. We want to do the right thing. And we look under, we see the triangle, we think it's recyclable. Only two out of the seven are recyclable. So this is why we, uh, I think, Billy, you came in late. Uh, less than 10% of our things are recycled. 90% end up in the landfill somewhere. So this is how we got here. So the plastic industry, they knew. Well, you know, your program on mushrooms was so interesting. <laughs> I thought that was going to cure everything. <laughs> I suppose to attack plastic and destroy it? <clears throat> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But that that's such a long way. That's such a long way. We don't have much time, Billy. We really don't have much time. The, the, the real problem is that the plastic industry has to stop using the plastics that can't be recycled and also fix the, the problem. The, the biggest problem is single-use plastic. That's what I mentioned before. Uh, and if you go to a supermarket, everything is in plastic now. Almost everything is in plastic. So vegetables. Yep. Besides liquids, right. Yep. The fresh produce is now wrapped a lot. Well, why have we stopped using glass? It's more expensive. Heavy. And, and it is more expensive, Billy. And it's heavier. And it's heavier, yeah. And it's breakable and you know. Yeah. Do you guys remember I did a talk also on clothing, the single use yes. clothing? Again, these things are so cheap to manufacture. It, it, it comes down to money again, which is sad because we're destroying a, a, um, a planet for profit. So uh, single use plastic is so cheap. It costs more to recycle it than it does to produce it. So Tom? Yeah. So what is the solution to all of this? The, the plastic industry, I, I think they have to be sued or something. Something has to be done. You, you saw how the cigarette, what we did with the cigarette industry. Right. I mean, right. we but really can't. can be used instead? I mean, what can we use? There are good options right now. There, there, are, there are some um, things that are made from plant, plant-based stuff that you can actually use instead of plastic. They, they, they look and it feels like plastic, um, but it's actually plant-based and biodegradable. Um, but Again, this is not what the oil, uh, the um, plastic industry, this is not their forte because plastic comes from oil. So right, this right. is this is their infrastructure. Right, right. Yeah. About uh, 
paper products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, this is a very, very frustrating <laughs> uh, problem to, uh, to solve. Let me show you what happened in Salem in 1994, where they came up with this, this brilliant sorting machine. And let's see what happened with that. Let's watch this. You heard about a surprisingly similar effort that took place more than 25 years ago at a recycling company 50 miles away called Garten Services. We're going into the office. I've, I've got a couple of newspaper articles I want to show you from the past. The plastic industry had brought a demonstration project here in 1994. The Garten Foundation of Salem unveiled a new sorting machine that may change the way we recycle forever. This million dollar plastic sorting system in Salem is the first of its kind in the world. So here uh, we've collected some old newspaper articles from 1994. Will Posegate is the chief operating officer of Garden. I mean, it says it sorts out the problem. Um, a sort, you got, a sorting a machine, sorting that's machine. right. You got this from? From the Plastics the Council. Plastics. They wanted us to sort plastics when people thought plastics might be starting to be a problem. Today, the American Plastics Council unveiled the machine. They say residents will put all their plastic containers in one bag. Just keeps getting better, doesn't it? What, what oh, happened? Oh. Years later, we, it, we shut it down because there was no way to make money at it. And we sold that $1.5 million machine for scrap. You sold the machine for, for scrap. scrap. That's right. It didn't make any sense. And I'm, I'm afraid that the same thing is happening right now. This is the plastic that nobody wants. The whole idea about, oh, just sort better, it'll be great. Let's make more single-use plastics. Don't buy into that. Not a good idea for the environment, not a good idea for the earth, not a good idea for your wallet. You can't sort your way out of this. No, no, period. It all made me wonder whether the plastic industry is just recycling old ideas. They said I couldn't dream. Called me a piece of trash and swore that's all I'd ever be. Like in the 90s, the industry has been spending money on ads. always wanted to be encouraging consumers to recycle remember a lot of the plastic packaging that you have in your kitchen is recyclable smoke jumping is the pinnacle of wildland firefighting and touting the virtues of plastic we're covered in plastic based gear from head to toe that came together to change the world. What do you think? Deja vu all over again. Why do you say that? Tell me about that. Uh, this is the same kind of thinking that ran in, uh, in the 90s. What do you think the messaging is here? And it's showing the people picking up the litter. That kind of implies that that's where the responsibility lay. I, I think the chemical industry and the plastics industry specifically need to take very seriously this reaction that's going on. I don't think this kind of a advertising is, is, is helpful to them at all. Lately, there's been a lot of talk about how plastics impact our lives, for better or worse. The reality is, for all the ads and promises over the years, it's estimated that no more than 10% of plastic has ever been recycled. And the guy industry tapped decades ago to get recycling going isn't surprised. I showed Ron Liesmer industry reports we found dating as far back as the 1970s. And this one talks about the cost of separating plastics from other trash. There are various types of plastics and that the cost of new plastic is so low that sorting and reprocessing used plastic can't be justified economically. And this was in 1973. Have we made any progress? I would say that their conclusions uh, in 1973, you said, mm -hmm. uh, are still true. The economics that are described there um, are still prevail today and likely will prevail tomorrow. Wow. So I'm sad to say it, but 
that's that's the truth that recycling does does not work and the best solution is to we have to stop just using plastic i don't know how we're going to do that because there are so many things are in plastic but we have to stop using plastic microcilium <laughs> microcilium yeah 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 you got to ramp those industries up and yeah, more, yeah. Uh, I don't know where you guys shop, but I, I know the Vons and all this. You, you go in and there's plastic everywhere. Yeah. You, you get on an airplane. Everything on, on, on the, an airplane you see is plastic. Yeah. Look around your apartment yeah. and you'll be amazed at how much of it is plastic. Absolutely. So I, I don't know if we can fix the problem or, or how long it will take. I think it would take a very, very long time. But again, if these industries are still ramping these things up, how can we ever get anything fixed? So China, China for a long time, what we, what, what we like to do is our source our problems. We like to say, hey, put it on somewhere else. And that's what we were doing with China. And at China at the time, they didn't care. They said, send us all your plastics all, and we'll sort it out there. And that's what we were doing. We were taking our plastic taking the good quality and then sending China whatever was left over. Well, China grew their own economy and that's when they said no more. We only want the high grade stuff. We don't want the cheap stuff anymore. And then we didn't have a place to send it. So what do we do? We look for another buyer. We went knocking on doors. And this is not just the US, just to say that this is the UK also, this is Canada. I mean, this is Australia. Where do you think is the number one dumping place now? Africa. No, not Africa. Well, the ocean, really. The well, ocean. Well, I mean, what we, we still have a buyer, okay? It's Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia has replaced China as the number one dumping ground now. So what we did to China, we're now doing to Malaysia. And Malaysia said no more also. They're fighting back. Let's go ahead and look and see how Malaysia became the number one because now they're sending stuff back from um, Canada and sending stuff back to the UK, but it's almost destroyed the entire landscape. There's so many illegal operations in Malaysia who are buying this stuff and you know using what they can and then burning the rest, which is destroying the whole env environment there. Let's go ahead and take a look in Malaysia. Uh, I don't think that's it. Oh, do I have it? Sorry. I think this is it. Yep, here we go. Since the introduction of curbside recycling in the 1980s, recycling has been hailed as the answer to our environmental woes. And while the system was never perfect, it evolved into a vast global economy worth around $200 billion. For three decades, the U.S. sent ships full of plastic waste to China. Chinese plants would then recycle this waste to use in the production of new products. For the U.S., this was cheaper than recycling domestically. And for China, there was a high demand from the booming manufacturing sector. But on December 31st, 2017, China suddenly closed its borders to 24 categories of recyclable waste. It threw the US into a recycling crisis. As China's economy had grown, it began producing more virgin plastic and had more plastic of its own to recycle. No longer did it need to import plastic waste and high income countries that had relied on China for decades had a big problem. Towns are struggling to deal with piles of plastic, paper, scrap metal, and other materials with no clear destination. The move has created a crisis for recyclers here, now facing mountains of materials they can't get rid of. In response, the US, Europe, and Japan began distributing plastic waste to a wider net of poor countries. And basically overnight, Southeast Asian nations became the world's largest importers of plastic scrap. From January to November 2018, Malaysia imported about 435 million pounds of plastic scrap, just from the US. Imports of plastic trash doubled in Vietnam, 
and increased by a whopping 1,370% in Thailand. This massive increase in waste imports has left countries like Malaysia scrambling and overwhelmed. A University of Georgia study found that Malaysia mismanaged 55% of its own plastic waste. These inefficiencies have only been magnified as imports have increased. The plastic that cannot be recycled, it will just end up in open burning, also dump it in some uh, rural area, such as um, uh, landfill. Heng Kia Chun is a Greenpeace activist based in Malaysia. He sees the effects firsthand. And that is why the cost of uh, water and also soil pollutions. In some uh, illegal facility that processing plastic waste, Local community members were complaining about the increased risk of the uh, air pollution because uh, the illegal operator didn't uh, comply with all these environmental regulations. The result has been devastating on local towns. Illegal factories burn non-recyclable waste by the container, filling the air with toxic chemicals like mercury, dioxins, and polychlorinated biphenyls. Residents in Jen Jerome told BBC they experienced rashes and violent coughing attacks. The Malaysian government has been cracking down on these factories, but in their wake, mountains of trash remain, seeping into the soil and contaminating waterways, like this one outside of Kuala Lumpur. In January 2020, Malaysia said that they had had enough. Malaysian Environmental Minister Yao Bi Yin said that they were going to send plastic shipping containers back to the U.S. There are people that would like to see this as uh, the rubbish dump site of the world. Uh, you dream on. So we will send back. As of January 20th, 2020, Malaysia had sent 150 containers back to their 13 countries of origin since the third quarter of 2019. For a long-term solution, Malaysia is backing a 2018 proposal from Norway that aims to add plastic scrap to the list of materials covered by the Basel Convention. The 1992 treaty regulates the movement of hazardous waste between countries. It was specifically designed to prevent developed countries from sending their waste to less developed countries. But plastic waste isn't on the list. Experts say that the recycling crisis has been a much needed reality check for Americans. Shipping containers full of waste arriving on our shores could force the American government to reinvest in domestic recycling and instate further anti-plastic legislation. So in order to solve this crisis, we really need to go upstream and already start thinking about, you know, what how do we even bring products to people without creating all of this waste? Sarah Wingstrand is a program manager for the new plastics economy at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Today we design super complicated plastic packaging. Um, so we might even have like several types of um, layers of different materials, different types of plastic all glued together. We need to fundamentally rethink how we create or make the plastic in the first place in order to make sure that it actually can be kept in loop. The world's recycling economy has been forever changed. No longer can nations turn a blind eye to the plastic waste that piles up in faraway landfills. After decades of recycling campaigns that have failed to get people to recycle more, high-income nations need to take responsibility for their own mess. Wow. Okay, so we know what the problem is. <laughs> Griff? I, I have a little bit of positive twist on this, which is there's a popular book out by an economist named uh, Kate Raworth, and it's called Donut Economics. You can get it in the library. I checked it out, put it back. Uh, Zoli knows about this book. We're all used to seeing the economic charts where uh, demand versus supply, those charts. This woman has developed a whole course in economics. It's all about a donut that you have the inside, you have the outside circle, and we have to live in that donut. If we get outside 
things of the problem you're doing if we get inside the economy doesn't work in there. And then what she said is we have to fundamentally change the education in the economics profession, especially in MBAs, because the incentive is for you to do it at the very minimum cost, make your big uh, profit, and then push the cost, the actual cost of your product to the commons and let the people solve it themselves. And now I don't think any of this is gonna happen, but she articulated it really well. And uh, you, us chasing it is not gonna happen. There's gotta be a fundamental change in academics and business. And now we, I, I heard, I read one time, as I get old, I'm quoting this guy, he says, as I get older, I try to remain healthily skeptical without this becoming cynical. Mm. And uh, that's the best we can do that's, at this stage. That sounds healthy, yeah. Yes. But Donut Economics by Kate Raworth. Very good book, it is readable. Thank you, I'm gonna get that actually. Yes, I am too. And, and especially, especially tackle the MBA world. Yes. Those are the guys that are making all these decisions. Yes. Those are the same guys that gutted all of the small towns across America and sent the jobs elsewhere. Yeah. And they, nobody's holding them to account. Right, right. Very interesting. Okay. Well, it, it's good to have hope. I think that if you lose hope, that's everything's gone. Uh, donut economics. So let me ask you a question, Griffin, everyone else. So should we continue to recycle? Yes. Okay, Linda, say yes. Why? Because 10% is better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, part of the advertising that the uh, in industry did in its own interest uh, did make people aware of their responsibility. Uh, uh, you know, uh, picking up trash and, and you know, their communities have regular uh, programs where they go out and, and, you know, pick up trash along the freeways or the beaches or in the desert or whatever their environment is. Uh, so they have had, some, uh, you know, a lot of benefit. Uh, so I do hope that there is a solution that can be presented to us. Uh, I I'm rather skeptical at this point, <laughs> of course, but yeah. yeah. So, and I agree with Linda, it's better than nothing, but uh, don't let it uh, upset you or because it is, it is upsetting or frustrating when you see people not recycling or stuff like that, just, you know, because yeah. All we can do is our best. That's it. That's it. And hope for the best. And hope for the best. And hope for the best. Uh, but I, I hope you guys were learned something new today. Did you know that the industry had really created this mess? Nope. They could have nope. fixed it. But, you know, like Griff said, it, it's all about that profit. And they look for a way to manipulate the public. And it worked. I think it worked better than they even expected uh, because profits uh, skyrocketed. Um, but, yeah, I think people need to know the truth. And we just need to stop using plastic as much as we can. But, like I said, again, it's hard. If you go food shopping, you can bring your own stuff. Uh, but if you're buying something that's packaged in plastic, you have no other choice. So, yeah, gang. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty, uh, <laughs> pretty tough, huh, Tom? Well, no, it's, yeah, you just, but just where are the alternatives? That is what, what, what gets me. Yeah. 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 I, I think we're far behind. I think the alternatives will come maybe 30, 40, 50 years from now. Yeah. Um, again, it'll be too late. <laughs> it'll be too late. Yeah. Yeah. Um, chemistry will solve it. <laughs> <laughs> Better living through chemistry. Yes. That's, maybe, maybe biochemistry. That's that's probably what, or, you know, yes, or something. Yeah. yeah. But these DuPonts and all that stuff, this, they got us here. And this is where we're at right now. So. So what, right. was, what was this author's name, Kate, uh, the, uh, the Dote Nut Economics, that's her last name? Raworth, R-A-W-O-R-T-H. Or maybe yeah, Ray, Rayworth, or how would you pronounce it? Raworth or Ray, Rayworth, thank you. And so she ends up being the, uh, 
the, the radical socialist in the <laughs> economics community who's marginalized and uh, try to get rid of. But if she can start a revolution, we'll all line up behind her. Somebody yes, has to be absolutely. That revolutionary. Absolutely. I mean, we need that inspired uh, leadership and as right. well as uh, the ideas. Uh, so she, uh, 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 she is the uh, Palo Solari of, uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, economics. <laughs> Palo Solari, of course, was the architect that uh, suggested uh, that we should all congregate in cities and then lead the countryside pristine around us for us all to share. I think he called it Palo Solari, but her mind apparently works in the same in the same way. So we shall see. Yeah, I'm gonna pick that up. Maybe we'll have a, a presentation on it. Yeah. All right, gang. Well, thank you so much for joining. Any final thoughts before we wrap up? Cynthia, you want to say something? You're muted though. Just unmute yourself. You're muted, Cynthia. <laughs> Sorry. It was hey. a very informative. Uh, session. My uncle ran Keep America Beautiful. And now I wish I'd paid more attention to know whether he was an independent person or whether he was being manipulated by the oil industry and the plastics industry. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. They're still around, by the way. Keep America Beautiful. They are. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. that that's very interesting. I learned um, something today that Indian was an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised. He actually made his living uh, playing uh, Indian. Indian Indian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. The manipulation never ends, does it? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> all right, gang. Good to see you all. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Sorry, Billy, what'd you say? I'm wondering why landfills went out of style. Uh, we bury everything. Yeah, and there's there's still a lot of space to put landfills in, so they will start using that again. They're still using that, but um, some people were uh, worried about the toxicity of the land and, and how they're confining the, the the stuff, but they're still using landfills today. So, but no one wants to live near one. That's the problem. So, all right, you guys. All right. See you next Wednesday. Have a great week. All right. We'll have another great topic. Bye-bye, you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Tom. Good to see you. Bye, Griff. Bye, Billy. Bye, Linda. Bye-bye.